Is the US government on the cusp of disclosing the presence of non-human intelligences on our planet? There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. It's looking more and more like we might be on the verge of some incredible revelations in this area. In July this year, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer proposed new bipartisan legislation which will mandate the disclosure of Pentagon records concerning the UFO phenomenon. In theory, what this bill would do is compel the Pentagon to release a lot of their records that they have as they relate to UAPs. So is the holy grail of ufology, disclosure, really coming soon? And if so, when might we see it? In this episode, the second in a two-part series, I'm once again joined by ufologist and researcher Bruce Fenton. And we're going to try to answer that question. We've now got a kind of presentation of this fact which involves talk of non-human intelligences and I believe also references to you know potential biological materials and this idea that you know that there's going to be penalties for anyone that's hiding what really is you know crashed alien craft or bodies um, so it's quite extraordinary to think we're living in a moment where that could really be presented you know quite straight faced to you know, the, the wider government system and, of course, to the media. Either there are a lot of, you know, highly credentialed people that are completely bonkers, right, or that have some kind of strange self-interest that has led them to lie to their kind of their superiors, or there really is some kind of hidden program. But before we wade into this, I just want to let you know that I am currently taking bookings for private natal consultations in which we'll meet on Zoom and work through your astrology and help you situate yourself in time and find calling and purpose in life. And I'm also available for electional consultations too, in which I will find the best possible time for you to take action and maximize the chances of success for whatever important things you're planning to do in life. Thanks for listening, and let's get into this. Why is all this UFO stuff happening now? Well, one factor that we've talked about before on this channel is Pluto in Aquarius. Yes, I know Pluto has retrograded out of the sign, but the horse has bolted, the die is cast, the era has begun. In this video with SJ Anderson, we noted how the bombshell story around whistleblower David Grush appeared back in June with Pluto and Aquarius. Grush says the United States is not the only country that has encountered non-human intelligence. He says our geopolitical rivals have their own crash retrieval programs. And previous Pluto and Aquarius transits have been marked by the theme of various peoples of the world discovering that the planet was much bigger than they thought and that they were not alone. For example, with Pluto and Aquarius from 1286 to 1308, Marco Polo was living at the court of the Yuan dynasty in China and then returned to Europe with tales of a magnificent civilization at the other end of the world. Later, this would inspire European explorers and the empire building and colonization that followed. During the next Pluto and Aquarius transit from 1532 to 1553, we saw early encounters in South America between the Spanish conquistadors and the indigenous peoples of that continent. And during the next Pluto in Aquarius transit from 1777 to 1798, we once again saw a theme of the West and China coming face to face, when a representative of the British Empire formally met with the Chinese Emperor for the first time, the so-called McCartney Embassy of 1793. And the British began in earnest their colonization of Australia, a continent that already had occupants during the same period. It's worth bearing in mind, and maybe even a little ominous, that these encounters didn't end well for the indigenous peoples on each occasion. But the broader archetypal theme is one of civilizations learning that they were not at the center of things as they had thought, that there were other centers in other parts of the world too. We see an expanding frontier in these times. It's not too hard to see how an encounter with a non-human intelligence is similar in some ways to the events of these previous Pluto and Aquarius periods. But there's another reason why all this UFO stuff is happening right now. As we saw in the previous episode, the emergence of the modern phenomenon arguably came in the 1890s, and there was a huge wave of sightings of strange airships 
in the United States. And as we've also seen, it's possible that this phenomenon is nothing new. Many researchers believe it's been manifesting in different forms throughout history as the many magical beings of folklore. But the 1890s marks the moment when the UFO phenomenon begins to manifest as a kind of technological, machine-based phenomenon. This system, this intelligence, whatever it is, seems to be adaptive. And so it presents things to us in ways that fit better with that time. You know, so we've seen how people were looking at things that they could understand that were just at the edges of their understanding. Say so the airship phenomena, you know, it was a little bit ahead of what most people would, would be familiar with, but it was either in development or, you know, just about coming soon kind of thing. So they're seeing like almost oh, where our technology is going and it's kind of presenting itself. And this came at a moment of huge astrological importance because it was around this time that we saw the last conjunction of Pluto and Neptune, whose near 500 year synodic cycle speaks to the evolution of human consciousness. Pluto and Neptune made three conjunctions in 1891 and 1892. And it was around this time that we saw our civilization's first attempts at flight and the emergence of technologies like radio and alternating current. These are technologies that have helped bring about a more global consciousness, even if it still has a long way to go. And at the same time, the UFO phenomenon appeared in the form of flying machines and their strange occupants. This was also a period of great spiritual ferment. It was around this time that Nietzsche declared that God is dead. And in Beijing in 1899, the Chinese emperor performed for the final time in history, China's sacred winter solstice ritual at the altar of heaven, informed by thousands of years of history. And so God was dead in China too. Around the same time in the West, something new was being born. The Theosophists were fusing Eastern and Western spiritual ideas and giving birth to the New Age movement. So there was a lot happening at this time. And I think all of these developments, including the emergence of the spiritual, not religious tendency, the birth of the instantly connected world, and yes, the strange airship sightings tied together in ways is probably too early for us to truly understand. If you're enjoying this video so far, please do give it a like and subscribe to this channel if you like my content. Thank you so much. So it seems as though the UFO phenomena is adapting and changing to the understanding of those who are participating in the experience, right? And that itself is very intriguing because if it was simply aliens visiting us, why would they do that? You know, why would they care about that? Because I couldn't imagine us, you know, visiting you know, another civilization in our space program and setting up such a wacky sounding kind of interaction with them, right? It, it doesn't seem to make sense if it was just as simple as there's an intelligence that wants to contact us. Um, this seems to be more about working in harmony with the evolutionary processes of our civilization. Now, when we look at where the conjunctions of Pluto and Neptune took place, we see something interesting. There were three conjunctions. The first two happened at 8 Gemini, the ninth degree, the third at 7 Gemini, the eighth degree. And 8 Gemini is a very interesting degree. Here's the Sibley chart used for the birth of the United States on the 4th of July, 1776. Look at the location of Uranus in the chart. Yes, it's at 8 Gemini. So we might wonder if this tells us that the US has a special role to play in this Pluto-Neptune cycle, one involving Uranian themes. Uranus is named after the Greek sky god and has to do with themes like revelation, the unexpected, and the new. Remember, most of the airship sightings of the 1890s took place in the US, and I think it's fair to say that the US has played an outsized role in the story of the phenomenon since that time, and it's certainly doing that right now. So we've looked at the events around the time of the conjunction of Pluto and Neptune. What happened when they moved into a sextile? the first major aspect of their synodic cycle. According to Richard Tarnas, sextiles begin to become manifest when two planets get to within about six degrees of each other. Pluto and Neptune move to within six degrees of a sextile around 1940, when the Second World War was underway. It was around this time that 20th century UFO sightings began. I mean, we have the initial, the stories of the Foo Fighters, of course, during the Second World War, which many people take as being the beginnings of the kind of the, the modern UFO age, where we have these strange glowing spheres that were following both Allied and 
German, you know, aircraft. There were all kinds of reports of people wondering whether or not these were an advanced technology being used by their enemy. But these reports were on both sides. So n nobody seemed to be in control of these strange spheres. The famous UFO incident that gave birth to the term flying saucers came in 1947 when pilot Kenneth Arnold claimed to see nine shiny saucer-shaped objects close to Mount Rainier in Washington state. So one of the modern ideas of what a UFO is, a flying metallic disc-shaped object, was born at this time. So we start to get this kind of new phenomena where it's no longer glowing orbs. You know, these seem to be structured vehicles. And so after the, you know, the late 1940s and onwards, we have this switch over into a whole range of what appear to be, you know, physical, metal, structured vehicles, triangles, spheres, all kinds, you know, after that. Now, the interesting thing about the Pluto-Neptune cycle is that because Pluto's cycle is highly elliptical, there are parts of that almost 500-year cycle where Pluto speeds up and moves at roughly the same speed through the zodiac as Neptune for decades at a time. And this means that the angular distance between the two planets also stays constant for long periods. So we get very long aspects. And we're in one of those periods now. Pluto and Neptune have remained within six degrees of a sextile aspect since the 1940s. Every single person born since that time has a Pluto-Neptune sextile in their natal chart. And the topic of UFOs has been bubbling away since that sextile began, although it has waxed and waned in the public consciousness over time. You get these periods where there seems to be a lot more reports of you know, strange sightings, but also media interest that kind of builds up around the topic. And for a while, you'll have a bit of a feeding frenzy with all kinds of you know television news and, and print news, full of stories about you know UFOs and close encounters and all of this stuff. And then after a while, it begins to fade away. And so there tends to be a kind of a crescendo where it's, well, is the evidence going to come? Or is this great revelation or disclosure going to happen? And when it doesn't, then the topic kind of, you know, it, it, it sinks away again into the background. And the sextile itself has waxed and waned because there have been periods since the 1940s when the sextile has drifted apart and periods when it has been going exact. And it seems to me that the UFO phenomenon has become more prominent in public consciousness during these periods when the sextile is going exact. For example, it was going exact in the years between 1950 and 1956. It was in 1953 that the term unidentified flying object, UFO, was coined. And during the second of these periods, from 1976 to 1986, Steven Spielberg released his blockbuster film Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which featured a French scientist character based on Jacques Vallée himself. The film stimulated a massive wave of interest in the UFO issue, as did E.T., another alien-themed Spielberg film from 1982. E Right now, Pluto and Neptune are getting closer and closer to that sextile again. Between 2026 and 2032, those sextiles will start going exact again. I think it's no coincidence that the UFO phenomenon is exploding into consciousness again as we move towards 2026 and beyond. UFOs have long been treated as a joke by the media, but in 2017, when the Pentagon started releasing footage of unidentified craft, things really started to change. In 2017, we had this infamous New York Times article that talked about this secret UFO program that was looking into not only UFOs, but other paranormal phenomena, it's turned out really. But the article kind of focused in on UFOs. And there was also this chap, Luis Elizondo, who had recently retired, had come out of the shadows as a kind of counterintelligence agent who reportedly had been running this program. So it all kind of blew up that this, you know, this guy's coming out telling us that yes, the government are involved with UFOs, these conspiracies are kind of true, that there is a, a hidden program, and you know, there is government interest, all the things that have fed the kind of UFO conspiracy um, for years and years, you know, the idea that the government's holding back something. So this seemed to validate that. On top of that, we had the release of a couple of Navy videos, the famous Tic Tac video and the Go Fast video, that these seem to show objects, craft, performing in ways that are at least unusual, 
I mean, there's arguments to say whether they can be explained or not. The Tic Tac video particularly seems to persist as unexplained, or at least very poorly explained. And so you can see that there's some kind of object, doesn't look immediately like a plane. And the eyewitnesses to some of these events are saying that they saw objects performing in unusual ways or that they detected you know, larger fleets of objects and, you know, that we don't see video of, but that there is you know, more to these stories. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. So these kind of um, were pushed a lot by a new organization that formed TTSA, which was headed up by Tom DeLonge, of course he's you know, a famous rock star. All the small things. And so a lot of money, a lot of uh, ability to influence media. And so he formed his group around these kind of around these videos and around Louis Lozondo and this uh, kind of big breaking news. So around this, he brought together a team and we had people coming out of, you know, again, out of sort of the excellent military and out of the government that you know, joined together and were kind of saying that they were going to change the paradigm on this, that they were going to bring forward more evidence. And with such kind of clout, you know, you've got people with money, people with credentials. This brought again, media interest. From there, we've had a kind of a buildup over the last few years with other kind of insiders coming out, you know, former CIA leaders. Uh, we've had other agents and other, you know, military people coming out, pilots coming out, saying that they encountered strange phenomena or the effects of being near to UFOs and seeing you know, strange events. Like one CIA director was saying that a plane that had stopped in midair near a UFO. So some you know, really strange reports. And things are getting really hot now. We had the emergence of David Grush and his claims, and now we have this new bill, which seems to promise the possibility of the truth or something around the truth of these matters emerging. It's very hard for the media to totally ignore this. Even noted skeptics, you know, like, like Michael Shermer, you know, he's had to kind of wade in and say, well, we should now blow this all open and see what is the truth? You know, if we've got senators and, you know, all these kind of senior people talking about the topic, now's the time to really dig in and say, is there something here or not? But this is a complex topic. It's one where it's difficult to know who and what information we can really trust. I'm on the fence on it, but I would say that without the evidence, you, you have to be of a mind that there's the potential here for someone to essentially want to almost hijack reality and that they want to change your thinking on this topic for reasons of their own. And that this is a paradigm shift which does not need to be evidence-based. Often you'll have a motivated group, you know, that have an idea or a belief and they're out on the fringes and they want that belief in the center. So they can stage a kind of a coup, and sometimes that's real coups. And other times it's um, it's more of a manipulation or a spreading of those ideas. And eventually the paradigm is taken over. And that can be that the, those in power die off or are literally pushed out of place, or an idea goes viral and it becomes the zeitgeist and the particularly younger people on board, you know, you get a, a growing interest in something until it becomes the new normal. It's a term, of course, we've heard a lot in the last few years. But th this may be that, that there are forces that would like to see a new normal in which the population accept the idea there's alien intelligences here and that the US has secret technologies from them hidden away. And we may not be given an understanding why they want us to believe that, but that they may have some benefits from having that happen. That's a kind of a suspicion I have, just because otherwise, where's the evidence? You know, it looks more along that line than it does a revelation of here's the craft. And so it could be that while the UFO phenomenon is indeed real, the disclosure that takes place is an attempt to manipulate people and one that distorts the truth. The evidence is there to suggest there are other intelligences that we don't see, you know, whether that's in the, what we call the spirit world, you know, the people for an eon have had contact with non-human intelligences through uh, vision quests or even in their dreams or uh, channeling, uh, all kinds of other modalities of contact with what seems to be non-human intelligences. Now, on top of that, you know, my own work suggests that we've had physical interactions in prehistory with visitors from somewhere else. So again, that would be a you know, physical manifestation. I think we've had non-physical manifestations. I think that a paradigm shift to where the public accepts this on the face of it seems to me necessary 
logical and something that should have happened long ago. Where I think it gets a little bit complicated is there was um, a paper written by a guy called Alexander Wendt, and I think he's a kind of political scientist. And he points out that in our kind of anthropocentric model, and particularly the hierarchical system we live in, it's very difficult for the upper hierarchy, you know, governments and the military, to deal with real aliens, particularly intelligent, powerful aliens, because they would sit above the hierarchy instantly. Time's up. So this is like a Pandora's box, that if they're to reveal that there's, say, like a type 2 civilization operating in our solar system, the average person is going to be like, well, what does the type 2 civilization think, right? Rather than what's the president doing or the Senate or, you know, the MPs in the House here. All of a sudden, you're putting this big question mark in there. But, you know, what about them? Because surely they're really they're the real power in our solar system. He feels that government probably can't deal with that. And that makes me kind of suspect that if they're to do any kind of disclosure of this topic or bringing this topic to the mainstream, they'd want to remain in control of that. And so I suspect that they would either have to limit it to dead aliens. So say crashed ships, dead bodies, extinct civilizations, Okay, which they can reveal that something like a lost civilization on Mars that's extinct because you can kind of control that narrative or aliens that are largely or in total made up because then they're under your control. It's your narrative. You're telling the story of your made up aliens. They may use evidence that is really there and weave that into a story that can be controlled by that hierarchy. Now, of course, that would suggest that they feel that these real aliens assuming they're there, are not going to come in and show them up as being liars, right? But if, if they feel that that is a story they can control, I can see why they might want to do that. So it wouldn't necessarily discount there being a real intelligence, but you can see that there is a threat to the hierarchy itself. And that's so destabilizing. I think that's a large part of why we've had this kind of, not just just the conspiracy, but this paradigm and this narrative control and the dismissal of the topic this ridiculing of experiences you know the dismissing of the idea there's anything there because to accept that these alien intelligences are legitimate is to accept that there's someone else who is above the hierarchy and i think that's why we have this strange situation where you can have real aliens and at the same time a government kind of psyop involving aliens where they won't be truthful with you now an obvious question is if disclosure is coming, when will it be? I suspect we're looking at some time from 2026, which is a year with some incredible astrology that we've talked about on this channel before. The amazing outer planet configuration that my colleague SJ Anderson has labeled the basket. Check out this video here. But I also think there's another moment slightly later in the decade when things stand a high chance of happening. And that moment will be when Uranus gets close to 8 Gemini, which is the exact Uranus return of the United States and the position of two of the three Pluto-Neptune conjunctions of 1891 and 1892. When this degree has been stimulated in the past, the UFO topic has exploded. For example, on Thursday the 12th of January 2023, on the day that Mars stationed direct at 8 Gemini, the Pentagon released a major report on UFO sightings where it said it's unable to explain 171 of them. This kind of event is real confirmation that 8 Gemini is indeed linked to the theme of UFOs. Uranus will reach 8 Gemini in the middle of 2027 when it will still be in a flowing configuration with Pluto and Neptune. The basket energy, in other words, will still be alive and well. So I think 2026 and 2027 are the years when big revelations about this issue, aka disclosure, are most likely. And to get speculative for a moment, the legendary astrologer Andre Barbeau talked about how the astrology of 2026 was the best astrology of the century and promised the emergence of a global civilization that uplifts the less fortunate of the world. That doesn't look very likely right now, but perhaps disclosure is the kind of deus ex machina that could bring the world together. This isn't something I thought I'd be saying right now, but the news of the current moment seems to suggest that very strange things are not just possible, but very real. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. 
So that's it for this episode. Thanks again to Bruce for joining me and do check out his fascinating work. You can find him on Twitter at Geological SETI and on Substack at brucefenton.substack.com. If you enjoyed this episode and are interested in the astrology of 2026, then I suggest you watch the video series I made with SJ Anderson last year on the astrology of the 2020s. It begins with this video in which we lay out the amazing astrology that's coming that year. See you next time.